County Mayo, on the west coast of Ireland, there exists an environment still blessed by incredible beauty, the cleanest air in Europe, and a welcoming community living a tranquil, slow-paced life. I've been fishing here uh, since I was 14 or 15 years of age, all my life. Run a small farm, that's what we do. Just survive, let love the kind of thing we do. So the sea, the sea has been very, very good to the community here, you know, to the people of Ellis. It kept us going in hard times, you know. That's why I wouldn't like to uh, see it destroyed, polluted, or uh, even the threat of pollution would be uh, something I'd be very worried about. A fabulous place to visit, a fabulous place to live in, a fabulous place to work in, a fabulous place to do business in. We have some of the best facilities in the world, the best scenery in the world. In the year 2000, natural gas was discovered off the coast of Mayo. An energy consortium headed by Shell, the multinational oil corporation, has been looking for a way to bring the gas onshore. This has led to heated battles with the local community, who feel their way of life is under direct threat. There's four generations obviously here now. Until Shell tried to come and take it away from us. I want to be no master, I never was wanted to be a master. I want my family to live. My name is Joey Coyle and I'm a county councillor for this area of Balmullet Ackill and Belly Cry and I've represented this area for the past 10 years. Um, during this time that the, the Carob Gas project became uh, synonymous I suppose with the area you know and sadly it has brought us some bad publicity you know and as you can see this is a fabulous area out here, beautiful scenery, nice people and uh, a great place to live. Essentially the Carob Gas project to give you the full overview is a small to medium sized gas field based 83 kilometers off the west coast of Mayo and we have bringing a pipeline from the Carb gas field to a place called Glengad where then it will travel onshore for nine kilometers to the gas processing terminal here in Belnaboy and gas processing terminals is essentially a fairly simple system where we separate the liquids from the gas and the gas is then piped into the board gas system which then goes throughout Ireland and the gas from the Carb Gas project will, will be available for the Irish public hopefully at some stage in 2011. It was Enterprise Energy that came first. They were the first crowd that came here and they were just you could say as arrogant as Shell but I think they couldn't keep the arrogance up so Shell bought them out and took over from them, I think, in 2002. But even at the stage when they came first, they came, I think they had all their homework done on us. They had found out the type of people we were, that we were people that would welcome anybody to our community, which we would. So they just came telling us where they were going to, 
to dig to dig trial holes. They were going to tell they were telling us where they were going to dig them. They didn't ask us. I mean that's the first thing that dawned on me. The more when I moved up here like I started to learn more about the environmental destruction that was going to happen with this project and also the health and safety implications um, of it. You know, um, this hill here was, uh, there was a landslide on it and like to be building a high pressure uh, experimental project, and they call it experimental because there's nowhere that a project like this has been put through uh, a residential area um, where they won't have control over uh, what the pressure is uh, coming into Glengad. Um, they're also trying to force through a raw gas pipeline onshore, which would go past people's homes. Um, it would go under the road that my cousins drive on every day, um, which is a scary thought. Like, it's different from the pipelines that I probably drive over every day without giving a second thought to, because those are, like, already refined gas and already odorized. So if something leaked, you smell it. You call somebody to fix it. Here, if it leaks, it would probably explode. <laughs> um, that's kind of a terrifying thought. There is a grave danger of, of pollution into the sea and to, uh, to um, contaminate uh, shellfish. And I know this because back in the year 2000, when uh, shell started uh, coming to the, year, to the area first, I, I got the offshore EIS, the environmental impact statement, and I, uh, it was a bit too technical for me because like, I wouldn't have any education, you know, I left school early, I didn't go to secondary school. But um, I, uh, I sent it over to the University of Southampton to a guy there by the name of Alex, Dr. Alex Rogers, he was uh, a marine biologist, and I asked him, he was a complete stranger to me, and I asked him to uh, do a report, you know, to give me his analysis on it. And within two weeks, of uh, studying the offshore EIS, he rang me and told me that if this project goes ahead in its present form, he said, you and your family may, may as well pack your bags and get out of there, he says, people are going to die. And that was, you know, taking the whole, the whole project, the refinery, the raw gas pipeline, and most what I was interested in was the, the effluent pipe, the discharge pipe into Broadhaven, where it was carrying a cocktail of chemicals and discharging it into the open seas. But like even the sighting of Bellinaboy, it's in the water catchment area of Carmore Lake and like the Scottish EPA said that they wouldn't allow that to happen in Scotland and they have a long history of uh, would say licensing refineries, you know, so like why it should be allowed here. Um, like it, uh, it's going to cause pollution and it has caused pollution already to Carmore Lake you know the aluminium runoff for they removed a half a million tons a piece from uh, the Ballinaboy over half a million tons uh, from Ballinaboy and like the runoff from that uh, caused a lot already and once they start there's no doubt in my mind that uh, there'll be a lot more uh, a lot more pollution um, and a lot more um, just yeah, general degradation of the area. The water is monitored and tested by ourselves on a daily basis and also tested by Mayo County Council. Uh, it's also looked at by the Northwest Regional Fisheries Board and it is also tested by a test centre for Board Nomona. And the water quality there is of a higher quality than from any other tributary that's going into Caramore Lake. And there are a lot of concerns in the region and we appreciate that. We have done some testing but we cannot afford to do it on a continuous basis. And uh, some of our results show that the aluminium in the lake is rising. I think it's the most monitored plant or most monitored site I was ever in. You know, you can't make an omelette without breaking an egg and you're going to have disruption, you know, of people's lives. The council are covering up the pollution. Uh, Looking at the figures on the council's own website, it's clear to me that they're fudging the results. But like, you know, there, there's been a lot of scaremongering too of different things in this project. You know, about aluminium levels in Caramore Lake in the water. Like, if I thought for one minute that this was going to affect the drinking water for people about us, I'd be down there protesting myself.
Historically, the people of Eris have made their modest living off the land and the sea. But now, the Carb Gas Project, one of the biggest development projects in Europe, has brought a surge of employment to the area. For many years, since I was knee high, there was people from this area going to Dublin to meet ministers and delegations to try and get something for the area. And suddenly we had something on our doorstep that Dublin needed and the East needed, so I thought, you know, why not milk it for what it's worth, basically, to get jobs and infrastructure into this area here. Uh, over 950 employees are working here this week, and last week we reached peak employment. Numbers will start to reduce over the coming months, and probably by about 100 per month. The building of the project has been absolutely huge. We hear about the recession here and depression. Well, not in this area. There was a thousand people working down there after Christmas. That's a huge boost for jobs here. There'll be over 100 people working there full time. There'll be 130 jobs in total, 55 direct and 75 indirect. But like, nobody wants to see damage to the environment for jobs or things like that, no matter how many jobs. And I, 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 I'm confident in what I have seen so far. I am very happy from the monitoring committee, from the reports on them. I'm happy from the, the tests that have been done on water and that, that, the, that there is no immediate threat. In order to avoid any environmental degradation to the area, the Shell to Sea campaign was set up to urge Shell to build a refinery offshore at the wellhead where it would do far less damage. The goals of Shell to Sea are to get Shell to process the gas at sea, which can be done. They have their own technology that allows them to do it at the wellhead. I mean, it's not up to us to tell Shell what to do. The only thing we're trying to get Shell across to is that they're not going to, it's not going to succeed here. Now, our, our most option would be them to go to sea. But saying that, you see, they, they're not listening to that either. One of the main reasons that, that we didn't develop it is because the North Atlantic is a very inhospitable uh, climate and we would have had huge difficulties in bringing people by helicopter and Today, this morning there was a tragic accident in the North Sea. People can see the difficulties that there are of helicoptering people over and back to, um, to oil platforms or gas platforms. Yeah, well, we know that. But sure, that, the people that's going out there are going out at their own risk. I mean, if there's somebody working out there and he has to go out in a helicopter, he knows he has to go out in a helicopter. And he can say, well, there's too much risk, I'm not doing it. Whereas we cannot say, this, the pipe is going to be a risk to us here. Why don't they see that? I mean, that pipe can blow up in our village and it can kill a few hundred people. A few hundred families, it can wipe out complete families. The fellow that's gone into a helicopter to go out to work on a rig, he's gone in there with his own free will. He can just say, no, I'm not going there because it's too dangerous. I mean, we cannot say that if they put the pipe in here. In 1987, the Minister for Energy, Ray Burke, changed the law governing Ireland's oil and gas exploration. He reduced the state's claim on resources from 50% to 0%, abolishing royalties, and cut corporation tax from 50% to 25%. This stirred a lot of controversy in Ireland when the Carb Gas Field was first discovered as it meant the state would receive nothing from the 540 billion euro worth of resources off the west coast. Recently, Ireland has slashed public pensions, cut health and education funding, and the social insurance fund has almost become depleted. A stake in this money would solve all of Ireland's financial problems. Also, another aim of the Shelter Sea is that the natural resources of Ireland be used for the benefit of, of Ireland. At present, through the Carob Gas Project, the people in Norway would have big financial benefits from the project, but Ireland, the Irish people, would have none, which is ludicrous, to say the least. The questions on the royalties on the gas, you see, I'd be no supporter of Ray Burke or anything like that, but you have to remember back in 1979 when these licenses were given out, we were begging to try and get a gallon of petrol at petrol stations. There was nobody drilling for oil. If you talk with anybody 
like on the side of the street and kind of like sit down and uh, explain with them. Like most people accept that it's crazy. They accept that more than like Ray Burke and Bertie Ahern giving away our natural resources, that there is massive questions to be answered. How, how was that deal negotiated? The gas project is worth three billion to the Irish GDP. So to say that Ireland won't get anything from it is untrue. All of the gas from the terminal will be sold to board gosh and then it's sold on to the end user in Ireland. So the entire usage of gas from the car of gas field will be used within Ireland. So therefore there is at a number of points there are taxations including vast. They'd be paying a bit of a tariff for using the board gas pipeline. It wouldn't be too much, I don't know what it is. But they'd they'd be using the board gas pipeline from Ballinaboy to wherever they were their clients were, until it left Irish territory, that's all. The most frustrating thing is that we had a good deal back in the 1970s, Justin Keating uh, had like a relatively good deal, still uh, there would have been profits for uh, companies who came in and um, did the exploring and, and that, but then behind closed doors Ray Burke met with uh, oil officials with nobody else in the room and like there's massive questions about how that deal came in place. Of course there could be different deals. I tried, as I said to you before, I put a notice of motion in from the council and some of the people that's shouting loudest now didn't even support that motion where we would in this county take four to five million a year for this particular area from the gas thing. I didn't get support from some people that's doing a lot of shouting now and they were, they were sitting there in the council chamber when that motion went through. The state in this issue is... Uh is being seen gradually worldwide as being extremely corrupt. In 2005, five men were jailed for refusing to allow Shell onto their land. These men are known as the Rossport Five. The issue of the Rossport Five arose when uh, Shell were trying to get on people's lands in Rossport. Well, I stopped them from coming onto the land. That was the first thing I said, you know. They, when they went around looking for the signing at the beginning, they told the people the only reason they wanted the people to sign was to make it easier for them and for the people to get their money. They told them that they had CAO, that was compulsory acquisition out on our land, which meant that they could come in on our land regardless what we'd do, that they had their permission. So some people just thought when they heard that, they said, well, look, we might as well sign. Because the, the, the community is an older community that believes in what people tell them. So when they, they came, they told me the same thing. And I said, well, look, I'm not swallowing that. Like, I have to check it out or thing. So they brought us to court then and they took out an injunction on us, on our land. And the judge gave them the injunction that we couldn't interfere with them, that we'd have to let them onto our land. So when they came to, onto our land again, we, we stopped them again. So we were brought to court then again, and we were jailed. Because we would not say, we wouldn't say sorry to them, as simple as that. That's what the judge wanted us to do. Justice Finnegan jailed them indefinitely until they purged their contempt of court. And all we had done was try to protect our homes and our families and our environment and our neighbours. And I couldn't see anything wrong with that. For the simple reason I asked Shell to show me the, show me the consent they had to come onto my land. And they didn't do it. I was a, a married man at the time with six and family. So they said, well, look, what, he's not going to go to jail. So they just, I think what they meant to do was give us a sample of the jail for a few hours and that we'd purge our contempt after a few hours and we'd be out and that was shell away with what they wanted. But that didn't happen. They spent 94 days in jail. They eventually got out of jail, but they never purged their contempt, I think. I'd say we weren't in the prison until the... All the neighbours and the community came out behind us and rallied behind us. And that took place for the 94 days we were in jail. Between here, between Dublin, Galway, Cork, 
Belfast, you name it, London, everywhere. There was protests for us and parades and everything. And they only got out of jail because uh, Shell and partners were getting negative publicity over it. It led to rallies all around the country, protests at Shell and Statoil garages, uh, marches on the Dáil. So because the government and Shell were getting too much heat, that's how come they released them. I mean, we got loads and loads and loads of letters and postcards and you name it from all over the world, from Nigeria. I mean, the Nigerian people came to see us in prison. I mean, Bobby Peep was a great friend of Kin Sarweva that was hung. And he came to see, he came to prison to see me. You know, and he told me the story of King Sarweva and he said that, you know, that we were going down the same road. You know, he felt real sorry for us. So, I mean, when you, when, when all, when you see people like that taking interest in you, well, you say, the only thing you can say, well, I must be doing something right. Ken Sarawiwa, whose name is on the middle cross here behind me, was the leader of the movement for the survival of the Ogoni people, a movement which rose up in the region of Ogoni in the Niger Delta against Shell, who were destroying the environment and killing people with the aid of the Nigerian military. And Ken Sarawiwa and the eight leaders were framed for a murder that they didn't commit and they were hung at the behest of Shell. The Nigerian military were in the pocket of Shell at the time and together they managed and tried to wipe out resistance to what Shell were doing in Nigeria at the time. He said that he knew that his opposition to Shell would always end in death and ultimately he paid the price. I cannot say it's like Nigeria because the pollution is not here yet. But with the way Shell are behaving, they are behaving like they behaved in Algeria. You know, they try, they harass people. I mean, they have us harassed big time. I know you good workers, good news to you all down. Loud and lonely, you must come in. I want your name in the field. Let him go. We said, are you one? We said, are you one? A Gartha cordon thrown around the Corrup gas terminal early this morning was soon battling with up to 250 demonstrators. The first confrontation saw schoolteacher Maura Harrington trying to drive her van through the Gartha lines. I am hoping to um, be allowed to drive on the public highway as a taxpayer. But as the car was pushed forward, the Garthi smashed its windscreen and side window with their batons and brought it to a halt. Maura Harrington was dragged away from the scene. Really, the day that decided that I'd that I'd stay up here was the day down in Paddy McGrath's pier, or in the pier in Politomish, when uh, the guards forced their way onto Paddy McGrath's land against his wishes. On the 11th of June 2007, uh, Shell and the Gardaí arrived at Politomish, and the, at the land of Paddy McGrath. Basically, Shell were trying to put a port cabin down um, at the top of the pier, but. Uh, to do that, they had to go through Paddy's land, and he didn't want them going through, so... The McGrath family informed them that it was private property. The roadway leading down to the pier was private property, but they ignored that. And from what I understand, that uh, Paddy McGrath's solicitor was on the phone asking to speak with the superintendent, but the superintendent re was refusing to speak to him. So, the people were inside the gate, of McGrath's land and didn't, didn't want to let them through. 
there was basically about maybe I'd say the bones of 30 people behind the gate trying to keep the gate closed and then there was about 20 guards trying to push it open and like that was the most I've seen a lot of dangerous stuff uh, in my time up here but that was by far the most dangerous I thought that it was just insanity so the guardy cut the chain that the McGrath family had on the gate no, no, no. and uh, pushed the gate back the local people push the gate shut again and at that stage Superintendent Gannon ordered the HIMAC to be used against the people. Uh, the HIMAC was used to push the gate open and it crushed people between the gate and the embankment behind it. proceeded up on their way down to the pier, assaulting men and women, regardless of age and regardless of, he of their health. You put, hey, Tom! You, Tom, with the red stripe! Do it, put your hands on them! Uh, I, I got punched. Uh, a couple of times that day by guards um, and then I had bruises uh, on my arms as did like <laughs> people who were 60, 70 years old. And I didn't ever think the guards would do that to ordinary human beings. I mean, you wouldn't do that to animals, what they did to us. I mean, all we asked them was to help. We I have asked the guards on several occasions to help us, you know, but then again, but all boils down to money. I mean, they had got huge overtime for beating us and for throwing us into the drains and everything. I mean, that, that to me, that's not what you do with people that give. I mean, I have said to the guards myself, if I'm giving trouble or if I'm doing the wrong thing, why don't they arrest me? And all the answers they make me back is, wouldn't you love, will they? You know, I mean, that is crazy. That's not the way to uphold the law. Don't skip for the buses, don't listen to the lies. Perfect gadgets unless they're I want my family to live. If I'm doing wrong, arrest me, please. Arrest me. Arrest me, arrest me if I'm doing civic law. You're to implement the law. We are using force, you're not implementing the law. We are to implement the law. You need us arrested. Here you go. Come on. Come on if you have the law. I want my family to live. You're not going to kill my family. If I'm doing wrong here, I am and get the handcuffs on me and get the family here. Finish it for once and for all. What is he doing to us? What are you trying to do to us, you criminals? I mean, what I understood ever, if you did do anything wrong or doing that the law was supposed to arrest you and bring you to court. But that, that don't exist here anymore. So it don't. You know, they're just doing their own thing. Because the government have told them, like, you know, not to beat us out of the way. And that they have done. But saying that, that hasn't worked now. I mean, they brought in hundreds of guards and they beat people and they battered people, but we're still here. So it became clear that the rule of law 
did not apply when it came to Shell, that the Gardaí would do anything Shell required, which they did. And like for me, that was a really eye-opening experience because, uh, like, that showed me that the guards aren't there to uphold the law necessarily; they uphold specific laws for specific people. They took a charge of assault against Maura Harrington. They they claimed that she had slapped a Garda on the face. Uh, the amount of assault that they like, and to be honest, and I'm not just saying this, like the only assault I seen was by members of the Guard. Like people were very restrained that day. Even assuming that she had, it was the least serious offence committed on the day. The real criminal activity was committed by Shell and the Gardaí, in partnership. As a result of the incident at McGrath's, retired school principal Maura Harrington was jailed for allegedly assaulting a Garda. Of the Here's a little comic thing before you go. It's a little man. Uh, it's called the Comical Genius. And he ended up, uh, he wanted to join the guards. And most of the guards like to sell so It's only a comic. But well, you hear what happened to him. Um, he, uh, it's the air of the old song, Cod Liver Oil. Hey. Hey. I don't know what came in. Just said. <laughs> a comical genius was thinking one day how he take up the job and receive handy pay. He did not like begging and work was too hard, so he got a bright notion to join up the guard. Put the old hand in the old hand in the old hand in the well, he went up to Dublin, to the depot he went in. Got a new suit of blue, as bright as new pins. They drilled him, they drilled him, they drilled him so hard. The old sergeant proclaimed him a fully fledged guy. Did he ain't him, did he ain't him, did he ain't him. He's got shells, got shells, got shells, got It's the key to Mount Joy, and we're outside of it. <laughs> Maura Harrington at present, she's about, I think she's on her 21st day in prison. In Mount Joy for slapping the Garda. And uh, what was notable in the court was the fact that my video footage of what happened on the day was not allowed to be shown in court. And I believe that it is how the authorities are terrified of the video footage actually being shown in court. Because that will mean they'll have to take account of exactly what the Gardaí are doing in this area. Judge in our cases is none other than the wife of a government minister, Judge Mary Devins. She is the wife of Jimmy Devins, who is a junior minister for the health in this country. So, and uh, the Fianna Fáil party, and they're promoting and pushing their project. So the, this judge is biased, in my opinion. And, um, like, for instance, if any Shelter Sea protester comes up against her, she's uh, automatically uh, almost jailing her uh, heavy penalties. So I say, we're not getting fair justice either. In this case, Judge Devins, whose husband is still actively involved in politics, I mean, how can she possibly avoid the appearance of impropriety when I think it is improper for someone to be sentencing people to prison and basically calling them crazy? 
when they are opposing a project that her husband has spent his career promoting. Um, that's not a conspiracy theory, that's, that's corrupt politics. And that's the reality of Ireland right now. Maura Harrington wouldn't be in jail but for Shell. We know she's in jail for abusing a guard. We, we don't know, did she ever do it? We have been accused of things that we never done. We know ourselves that we didn't do them. The guards have accused us of different things. I myself have been jailed for assault on a guard day. And um, my son and another young lad, but we had to come out on appeal and go to a higher court to get these uh, charges overturned because we didn't assault any guard. That's not our business. I, I'm a 51-year-old man. I was never in front of a judge until Shell came. Maura, you couldn't imagine poor Maura doing a lot to a guard anyway. I mean, she is not a big woman. And I mean, it's very sad if a guard has Maura in jail for hitting him. That's the way I see it. Maura has a lot, a lot of good work put into this. Maura has been tarnished with wrong information and wrong doings down with the years since Shell came into the area. What was amazing in the court case uh, where Maura Harrington ended up getting jail was uh, Judge Mary Devons sentenced her to 28 days in jail. But after sentencing, she stated that uh, Maura Harrington had to have psychiatric assessment. Well, like, I mean, it's, 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 it was one thing for the judge putting Maura to jail, but to, to say off the stand that she needed psychiatric treatment, I think that wasn't the judge's job. In any court case that I know of, where a defendant was uh, ordered to undergo a psychiatric assessment. That always happened before sentencing. I, th I, think it's, I think it was terrible, just absolutely terrible. I believe Mary Devon's statement about psychiatric assessment was meant, yes, to give father to the media. Now, some of the media did pick up on the issue that Mary Devon's brought in the psychiatric assessment after sentencing. But some media used it simply to bash us, the local community, with. The media in general, I think, have been uh, overall pretty, pretty bad to us. Like, you know, there's been a couple of uh, uh, notable exceptions, like. The media response to the campaign was pretty positive back around the time when the Rossport Five were in prison and kind of earlier on in the campaign, but more recently, I think it's been really similar to what the media response in the US usually is to protests, which is to vilify the protests and the protesters um, in the short term and kind of on a larger scale to ignore the larger issues that are usually brought up by social protests. Taoiseach has criticised the Shell to Sea protesters after clashes at the terminal site that left four people in hospital. He said the protesters were breaking the law and he urged Shell to get on with building the terminal. Two people were arrested and later released. Certain papers haven't been good to us at all. They have written very, very bad stuff about us. And I, I cannot see how anyone can write bad stuff about us because we're only trying to do something that the government should be doing is looking after our community. And I mean, they have blackened us with all kinds of protests. We've all been called like provos that the IRA are running this campaign, which is like totally untrue. And anybody who has even a, like a cursory knowledge of the campaign knows that that's totally, totally untrue. And we're involved with Sinn Féin, we're involved with the IRA and different organisations. I didn't even know these organisations were in it before Shell started to be truthful. You know, not alone to be involved in them. We are not involved in them. Granted, Sinn Féin has come out in support of us, and a lot of people have come out in support of us in different organisations. And we have no hard feeling with that, because we need help. And wherever it comes from, we appreciate it. If the government gave us help, we wouldn't have to be looking to anyone for help. There is not a balanced version given. And the reason for that is... a. Uh, there are serious vested interests involved in the media and in the oil business here in the country. 
the media will obviously side with the, the rich and the powerful in this case. Like you look at Tony O'Reilly who owns most of the like the newspaper media in Ireland. The Riley family are involved with Providence Resources, who own a lot of uh, blocks off the coast for developing oil and gas. So they suggested at one stage, before the baton charge, that Superintendent Gannon take out the batons and crack some skulls. So Superintendent Gannon apparently took their advice. <laughs> There were more angry exchanges when the demonstrators blocked the road as a convoy of vehicles taking workers to the site approached. Why are you stating this kind of violent For health and safety, Jim. First of all, it's not violent. It's been peaceful for two years since the cops came and started it. They're not being peaceful. They're pushing and shoving. Locals, we're locals. We're locals, Jim. The baton charge was ordered after the demonstrators refused to leave the road. The Shell to Sea campaigners at first resisted the Garthi, but they were gradually beaten back, protesting furiously at the level of force being used against them. Shell Ireland condemned today's action as intimidatory and disturbing for its workforce. Uh, there were quite clearly people there with an agenda today to cause violence. Uh, that is uh, something that Shell views very seriously and it's something that, uh, that is, uh, is not to be tolerated in a civilised society. And the negotiation is over. Uh, the rule of law has to be implemented um, and uh, the work goes on. And if there are those who uh, try to frustrate that, uh, they're breaking the law and it's a matter for the Gardaí to in, in, enforce it. Shell to Sea says scenes like these have added greatly to the tensions which already exist here. And it's campaign. The issue has caused division, you know, anyone that thinks different is fooling themselves. I have had people, very good supporters of mine that are against it, very good supporters of mine that are for it. The issue with the gas and Shell and everything has created a bit of division within the community but it has it has also helped some of the community to come together on a serious issue it's you could say it couldn't have brought it together kind of thing because it was so close before it started as it couldn't be much closer but they have tried with 10 years to divide it and yet anything that happens anybody in the community the community rallies around them the a majority of the community in the Eris region are in favour of the project, but there's still a sizeable group who remain opposed to the project. I would say that there's very few people who are who I'd class as pro the project. There's people who are indifferent towards the project, and there's people who have taken money to, uh, we'll say, to to work on the project. The majority of the people in this community do not want this project to go ahead the way that it's going ahead. Things seem more divided now, but I think that's kind of part of what Shell does, is they play into divisions that already exist in a community and just play them up and exploit them in order to get what they want, which is this project to go ahead as fast and as cheap as possible so that they can make as much profit from it as soon as possible. What Shell have done, what they consistently do worldwide is when they come into an area, they check to see who can be bought for a few euros. And uh, those people naturally will do whatever Shell wants them to do. They speak to the media on their behalf and try to turn people in favour of Shell. They have given out, um, we'll say, funding here and there to different community groups and that, that was one thing, the Castles report, which he was a government appointed mediator, that was what he did basically. He legitimised the bribery of the community, I'd consider, because he said that Shell should give out more money to these community groups. Shell have tried several times to get to the cross to our solicitors and our barristers, 
what let them name their price. So I mean, you, you know what that is as good as me. Like it's what? How much do you want? Well, as I have told them, I, I have told them. I said they, they laughed about me. I said Shell haven't enough money to buy me. So like they thought I was kind of you know crazy. I said no, and they said, how do you mean, Willie? Shell haven't enough money to buy you because I'm not for sale. I said I'm not for sale. I said it's not about money. Um, and that's their cure for it, throw money at the problem, but um, like thankfully, and it's been inspiring that like people are still willing to to not accept, the, like just not accept bribery, that they will work uh, and for the betterment of this area. And like it's been, you know, it's been tough up here, but it's also been very inspiring to see people stand up for what they believe in, stand up for their community and to stand up for the area, you know. I have said that from day one. It's not about money. It's about the beauty and the love we have for the place and the love we have for our parents and our grandparents. We, what we need it protected. In September 2008, the pipe laying vessel the Solitaire arrived in Broadhaven Bay to start laying the offshore section of the pipeline. In response to this, local fishermen lay 800 crab pots along its intended route and Moore Harrington began a hunger strike in protest. But then um, last September things got very uh, heated up, you know. Uh, the Shell offered the fishermen uh, 20,000 euro uh, each. And um, I had three boats and uh, I was standing to make 60 or 70,000 euro if I moved my pots from where they were putting the pipeline. We've been fishing pots there all our lives. So I refused to take the money and I refused to, to move the pots. I kept fishing. And they put in three warships, our government put in three warships, three naval ships, trying to scare us off. And uh, then the, Asol the Solitaire, the pipeline ship, arrived into Broadhaven Bay. And uh, we stayed in front tour, myself and my son and another fisherman. There was three or four or five fishermen all together, boats there. And uh, we were all arrested illegally, wrongfully arrested and held in Belmullock Oil Station to uh, give the uh, ship time to put down the pipe. But uh, we, we had uh, other people to take the boats out and uh, well, we were locked up and to stop them from putting down the pipe. At Clingad, where Shell planned on making landfall with their pipeline, they had uh, dredger working out in the bay. The now, local, uh, people on kayaks were out in the bay as well protesting and they got onto the pile of rocks that uh, the dredger had, where the, the dredger was excavating a trench. So the dredger then stopped work. But apparently somebody, either sh someone in shell personnel or the guardie, informed the dredger driver to start work. So the dredger driver filled a bucket with rocks and gravel and uh, tried to drop it on top of one of the protesters in the water. Right beside him. I filmed it and uh, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Right beside him, he nearly let down on top of him. If he didn't get him. What will be surprising to a lot of people what the Gardaí did next was they arrested the victim and let the perpetrator go. But then this is the car of gas where uh, anything Shell does is backed up by the law, even to attempted murder. It was it was uh, worrying times, like you know, but uh, 
I myself personally will go, you know, same thing again this year if it happens. I'm not bound to shell like, because I have my rights and I, I'm going to stick by my rights. Recently, Shell have begun to meet in private with two local community groups, Pubal Lakela and Pubal Kil Kaman, which includes some of the Rossport Five. There's only one solution to any problem you ever had. It's consultation, not confrontation. We never wanted to confront them. That's the sad part about it. Because that's not what we were here for. We, we didn't want to confront them at all. I'm, I'm asking them to meet us since they started in 2000. Like people have been asking that Shell come and um, meet them uh, openly, not behind closed doors, that they come and have public meetings uh, where their ideas and plans can be challenged, but Shell aren't doing that. So like they're being disingenuous to say that, that there's no sa safety uh, implications now. Like this is an experimental project and they are doing nothing or very little to, to dispel any of these, these fears that people have locally. I have asked them to call a, a meeting, a public meeting, for all the community to hear what's going on. They won't. You see, they don't want to... You see, they want to get you into a meeting individually and they'll tell you something... They'll tell me something different to what they'll tell you. So that will keep, keep the thing momented all the time. That's what they do. It's always been our policy that we'll meet any groups or any individuals who have concerns about the project. We were invited by the chairman of the forum, Joe Brosnan, to sit down with the two main groups who represent those opposed to the project, and we're happy to do that. And it, it, it has always been the case in, in any negotiations with any groups that it's better to meet representatives of a group rather than go to an open community hall where in those sort of town hall situations it normally results in um, a screaming match and nothing gets achieved. Ah, uh, yeah, but they're in talks. You see, Shell is talking to the fishermen and they're talking to the community. That's what they tell the wider public. But what, what Shell wants to do, they will do. They listen to nobody. Well, we have only talked to them once. So I believe it's, it's, it's too soon for me to say it's not going to work or it is going to work. I'm hoping. I'm hoping that it will work. But then hoping with Shell... You, doesn't, you don't know how far your hopes will have to go. Now, if the talks fail, at least we can always say we tried. We tried to resolve it before we died, when we will die. That's, that's the way I look at it. So if they're so arrogant that they're not going to listen to us, we're not stopping anything. We have to go full steam ahead and try and stop them. It's an issue of trust. There's no trust in Shell. But perhaps that's understandable anywhere they go. But there's also uh, the issue of no trust in the government or of any of the state agencies. Because they're not, they're, like, people are not stupid. You know you cannot trust them. Because somebody that keeps telling lies, I mean, you're going to find them out anyway. Like, so you're not going to trust that person. Like. You know, if you get the name of telling lies all the time, everyone know you and they say, well, look, don't believe him because he tells lies anyway. That's the, the impression people have of Shell. Nobody around here trusts Shell. The other thing that's happening here, I think, is kind of a, a deeper level of what's happening all over the world with companies coming in and saying, this is what we want, this is what we're going to do, and we're doing it. And then any time a community speaks up and says, actually, we know what's best for us, um, they're not allowed to speak for themselves. The Corrob Gas Project has to be put a halt to totally as their plan, because otherwise they can do it in any part of the country they like. So it's not just for us that this fight is important, it's for any part of the country where any multinational want to do what they like. But as long as Shell and companies like Shell have total control over these resources, they're going to use it for their profits and they don't care about the environment, they don't care about climate change, they don't care about the communities and they don't care about the country. For this project to proceed in any way, shape or form, 
It will have to be with the consent of the community. And from what Shell have done here already, they will never get the consent of the community. That's how I feel. I just cannot say that I, I cannot give up. Like, don't let people not get me wrong that I'm in this to get be made a hero of or to be classed as a hero when it's over, I'm not. I just wish I could walk away from it this minute. And I wouldn't want anybody ever to say anything to me about it. But we just cannot walk away from it. There's too much at stake in it for us to walk away from it. But kind of the other side of it, and the people who are still fighting this campaign, I think they see the long-term impacts of this, which is that their lives will never be the same with this project here. They're peace of mind, their security, their safety, their health, their environment are all threatened by this and it's worth a few years of fighting and struggle in order to really have their community back. Because we cannot give up. We're just ordinary people that have lived here all our life and reared our families here. We have families coming after us. We have grandkids. We want them to be here. They want Our family want to be here. If Shell get in, these people won't be here. So that, that's my message, and I think they will have to listen to it. Uh, Shell will come back again, try to force their way through, with uh, hundreds of Gardaí, possibly the army. Well, Shell is going to try and push the project, I believe, with the help of the Gardaí, the Navy, the army, whatever it takes. But we're, like, we're not going nowhere, you know, we're still going to be here. We have nowhere to go. We've been here all our lives. and. Uh, we're going to stay here, and uh, what's going to happen? It's good for anybody's guess. Hopefully, it'll resolve itself before that it gets. That's all I want. You know, I'd give anything this minute to do to get that done peacefully. But that's not saying that I'm going to lie down for that to happen and let Shell tap over me. I'm not. They have only two choices left at this stage: jail us or kill us. So, I mean, if they're going to go down that road again like they have already done. We'll have to just take the consequences and we'll, we'll be there, I'll be there. I'm not going to go away.